This video is sponsored by Sony. Over the last seven years as a content creator, I've owned, rented, borrowed, and tested dozens of lenses because I, like most of you, have gear acquisition syndrome. There are many that I've thoroughly enjoyed, whether there's some nostalgia for them or they serve some special purpose for achieving a particular shot, or maybe they're just a decent budget-friendly option. But regardless of how many I've tested, there are a select few lenses that literally never leave my camera bag. Why? Well, let's get into it. So I've been a Sony shooter since I got the A7 Mark II back in 2016. But as a full-time hybrid shooter who primarily focuses on landscape and adventure work, I'm now rocking the FX3 and Sony A1. As part of my partnership with Sony, I've had a chance to test tons of Sony lenses to pair with these cameras. But I landed on two as my everyday workhorses that never leave my bag. Those are the 16 to 35 G Master II and the 24 to 70 G Master II. And yes, Sony is a sponsor of my work, but I bought each of these lenses and all of my previous Sony gear for that matter on my own accord. Now, as an adventure creator, I'm constantly traveling, hiking, camping in my car, just generally on the move to capture my images. With that in mind, there are a few things that I'm looking for when selecting my lenses. First things first, I need versatility. I wanna keep my lens swapping and bag digging to a minimum. These two lenses are far and away the most versatile lenses in Sony's lineup. From the focal range alone, 16 to 70 can accomplish just about everything I need. But I was actually curious just how versatile they were, so I did a tedious little exercise to find out. So in my Lightroom catalog, I have 80,140 images that I captured on Sony cameras. I then filtered for all the photos that were taken at a focal range between 16 and 70 millimeters, which totaled 64,998. That means that over the course of the last seven years, 81% of my photos could be achieved by using the focal lengths offered by just these two lenses. And that number actually increases to 86.5% if we include punching into APS-C mode, which extends the reach of 70 millimeters to around 105. Whether you're capturing wide, expansive landscape photos in the middle of the Utah desert at 16 mil, or filming compressed scenes at 70 millimeters up in the Canadian Rockies, you basically only need these two lenses to give you a huge peace of mind. I'm actually super curious to know what your stats look like. So go into your Lightroom library, filter by camera info, and then let me know in the comments what percentage of your shots fall between 16 and 70 mil. And while you're down there, check to make sure you're already subscribed. In addition to the focal range versatility, having a consistent f2.8 aperture across the full range makes these two lenses even more replaceable in my camera bag. From a low light perspective, I'm never sitting there worrying about whether it's too dark to film once the sun goes down. I mean, especially when you're comparing it with the dual native ISO on the FX3, A7S3, or ZV-E1, it's basically like having night vision for your camera. I mean, you can film scenes lit by nothing but firelight or like a headlamp. I also spend plenty of nights with clear skies in the middle of nowhere. And while there are certainly lenses that are better suited for astro, the 16 to 35 at f2.8 can create some incredible astro images. And of course, at the long end, f2.8 gets you some incredible background separation for portraits or to isolate your subject in your videos. Obviously, both the original versions of these lenses had the same f2.8 aperture, but the addition of the dedicated aperture ring has been a massive improvement in my personal shooting style, since it makes each of these lenses much better for hybrid shooting. When I'm shooting videos, I can quickly and smoothly adjust the exposure with as little as a pinky spin. This also frees up the front dial on my camera, so in video mode, I have my front dial set to a custom Kelvin white balance. This way I can dial in my aperture, my ISO, and my white balance super easily without digging into any of the menus. And pro tip, if you haven't heard this already, but you definitely shouldn't be using auto white balance when shooting video. Otherwise the white balance can actually be shifting while filming a single clip, and you're gonna be in a world of hurt when it comes time to color grade. Another thing that I think a lot of people don't consider with the 16 to 35 and 24 to 70 G Master Mark II is the minimum focusing distance and magnification. 
Both lenses allow you to get extremely close to your subject. The 16 to 35 has a minimum focusing distance of 8.6 inches, and the 24 to 70 can focus at 8.3 inches at 24 mil and 11.8 inches at 70 mil. But the minimum focusing distance is actually only half the equation. What really makes these two lenses great for close-ups is the magnification of 0.32x. Magnification is how large the object feels in the frame. So while there are some non-macro lenses out there with impressive minimum focusing distances, it's the magnification that gives the image that more distinctly close-up look that's really great for storytelling and capturing detail shots. Now, neither of these is a true macro, but unless you have a very specific need for a macro lens, I don't think it's really necessary to even have it in your lens quiver, and there's really no need to be carrying around a hefty macro lens when you're realistically only gonna be using it for like a handful of shots from time to time. On the topic of carrying lenses, a really key reason why I continue to keep these two lenses in my bag is the size and weight. When you compare the size specs to the original versions, it doesn't really seem like much, but when you take the Mark I lenses combined versus the Mark II lenses combined, the difference is 324 grams, so about three-fourths of a pound. This actually becomes a quite noticeable difference when you're carrying around all day. I just did an 11-mile hike into the desert with the FX3 and A1, the 16-35 GM2, the 24-70 GM2, some water, some snacks, and an extra jacket. And that reduced weight absolutely saved my back. But it's not just carrying them around on your back. The handling of each of these lenses on the camera is ah, chef's kiss. Now, I understand that there are smaller and more compact lenses out there for the Sony system, but each of them make a sacrifice in exchange for that weight reduction. Which brings me to my next point. So if versatility and size are the core reasons why I always have these two lenses with me, the third key reason I've chosen the 16 to 35 and 24 to 70 GM2 over other lenses is that you don't really compromise much of anything with these lenses. As a professional, it's important to have top-notch image quality, be able to work quickly, and never feel like my gear is limiting me from doing the job that I'm asking it to do. Again, I've owned and tested dozens of lenses. In fact, according to that little Lightroom catalog exercise I did earlier, I've shot with 46 different E-mount lenses. Many of them are fantastic, don't get me wrong, but many of them have a but. This lens is great, but it's really soft at the corners at wide open apertures. That lens is awesome, but it suffers from really bad focus breathing problems. This other lens is incredibly sharp, but the autofocus is unreliable in video or in low light scenarios. The 16 to 35 and 24 to 70 GM Mark II have basically none of those compromises. Despite being zoom lenses, they're basically as sharp as primes, unless you're doing a very crazy pixel peeping comparison exercise. The focus breathing is basically non-existent. And like the autofocus, whether it's photo or video, high contrast or low light, tracking a subject or racking focus, both lenses do exactly what you want them to do regardless of the situation. And that's the point, right? That's why these lenses are always in my bag, because they're workhorses that perform exactly how I expect them to. Part of that includes speed as well, which, similar to the aperture ring, is why it's great to have all those dedicated buttons and switches right there on the lens. Like, sometimes you want a nice manual rack focus. Flip the switch, and we're ready to pull focus. Or in photo mode, I have my focus hold button set to focus magnification for the instances where I wanna quickly get a really much more like pinpoint focus location really, really quickly. And then in video modes, I have that focus hold button set to autofocus. That way when I'm filming myself, which I do quite often, I can really easily touch the lens without needing to reach behind the camera to set my autofocus. So whether it's image quality or functionality, you're basically not compromising anywhere. Well, unless you consider the price. Yes, these lenses are expensive, I get that. But for me, I prefer to invest in the best and know that I have a tool that's not gonna hold me back. Lenses hold their value incredibly well and you're investing in a system that you're likely going to be using for years and years. I'm super curious though, what lenses can you never leave home without? Let me know in the comments and I'll see you in the next video. Peace. How's it going? You have a camera? What lens you got there? What the aperture? Does it have good focus controls? How many XD linear motors does it have? Oh, okay, okay, we're getting.